Bible as we stand together and we'll read a passage of scripture. John chapter 4. John 4. For those of you who are visiting tonight, I'm not really a part of the staff here at the church, but I am at the school, the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. My name is Bob, and um, I teach a class at the school called the Emerging Church. And sometimes the Lord really has me take one of those panels of discussion and bring it in a church. Day. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Why don't I stop that comment and look right to the Bible? <laughs> or maybe that's a, a confirmation of what I'm about to say. I have a... We discuss in that class the identity of the church. What she is and what God really intended for her to be. And I discuss several items marks of her identity, and one of them is people of worship. And obviously God knew what I was going to speak on tonight. I really felt like the worship and the way we were led about in that was a confirmation of what God's going to say right now. Worship is the only expression worthy of God. Worship is the most human thing we can do. If we don't worship God, we're worshiping something else. And as a result, we'll start acting like animals. So worship is right. Worship is good. Worship is our fulfilling our role as the image of God on the earth. And unless we become in spirit, soul, and body people of worship, we will not fulfill our destiny on the earth as the people of God. And I think there's more to this than the church realizes. And I would like to discuss a few things about that with you tonight. So let's look to John chapter 4. And I suppose we can start with verse... The Samaritan woman said to Jesus... Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. See, up to this point, Jesus has been trying to steer her in a direction to recognize him. How many people know that worship begins when you understand God? Worship begins with a revelation. And now he gives her some insight into her own life in verses 17 and 18. So whereas before she was getting a bit sassy trying to steer the conversation away, now all of a sudden she becomes religious. And she says, Sir, I'm thinking you're a prophet. You know, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you all say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know. Because salvation is of the Jews. However, an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying God is not bound to Jerusalem, though he loves Jerusalem and will restore it. And God is not a Jew, fundamentally, though he became a Jew in the person of his son, and the Jews are his people historically. They have been and shall be redeemed by the blood of Jesus as a nation. But God is not seeking a person simply who's born a Jew outwardly. He's not just seeking someone who has been circumcised and embraced the feasts of the Lord. 
The Lord fundamentally is spirit. And he's seeking people who therefore will worship in spirit and in truth. So that the door flings wide open. If you will embrace the truth of the one who is sent from God and will enter into a relationship with God that is spirit, that is, that is personal, that is free, and that is led about by the Spirit of God, the ultimate definition of the true person of God, the one clothed with the Spirit, then you are a true worshiper. You don't have to be in Jerusalem. You don't have to be at this mountain. You just have to be in spirit and in the truth. And I would say to you that those who worship God in spirit and truth are those who fear him deeply. Because Isaiah 11 says that the spirit of God is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And it's impossible to have the spirit without having the fear of the Lord. I say to you that to worship God is to adore God with every fiber of our being. Not just to come to church or to fill some kind of form, that's religion, but to adore him from the heart. Because the same Isaiah chapter 11 that described the ultimate worshiper, the Messiah, Jesus, it says that not only will he have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, but he will delight in the fear of the Lord. I say to you that those who worship God in spirit and in truth worship God by magnifying his name. Because those people who really know the Lord and understand his heart, they understand that it is God's desire to make his name famous to the nations so that his heart becomes our heart. And we seek also to magnify the Lord. And I say to you that those who worship God in spirit and in truth know how to engage his presence in a very personal and intimate and deep way. And I say, if these things do not apply to us, we are not worshiping God. Father, I bless you and I worship you. I sense your presence. I see you clearly by the power of the Spirit of God in faith. Lord, we don't go by what our eyes see nor what our ears hear. We don't go by what our emotions feel. Lord, we go by the Word of God and we enter right now. We enter afresh and anew by an act of our will, a resolve of our consciousness to worship you and to believe in you and to have you now as our own, that you might have us. Visit us now. Suspend us, Lord. Suspend us that we might not enter into the ways of the flesh or thinking with the old man. But Lord, suspend us in the anointing of the Spirit that you might speak and act freely in our midst to build us and nourish us on the good word of the Lord. For Jesus' sake, in the building of the body of Christ, hallelujah, everybody said. Amen. Please be seated. Praise Jesus. It really is a profound privilege for me to address you tonight because I know that the people of God who worship here at Brownsville are here. It's their family night. And there is few churches, if any, really, that really match the call that you have on your life and the willingness and fortitude to go for it. Also, I know that there are visitors here tonight who are here by divine appointment, and you're the precious ones that Jesus died for. The psalmist said, as for the saints in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. So I really am before you with a certain amount of fear and respect, and it's a high privilege for me to speak to you, and I pray that the Spirit of God inject you with his life through what's said this evening. For those of you who are visiting, your friends, you're not sure that you've embraced this faith, or you know you have not, we welcome you as well. It's my privilege to address you. Certainly this will be an important part of your life. When I talk about worship tonight, and I go through those four points that I just went through, I have uh, an acronym, the word FAME, F-A-M-E, that really makes the four points that I'm going to give to you tonight, Lord willing. F stands for fear. Worship is the fear of the Lord. A is for adoration or to adore him. M is to magnify and E is to engage. And I want to talk to you first of all, usually by the way I'm not that organized, so you're blessed. I um, usually just get up here and start talking. <laughs> but um, 
This will help you to remember what worship is, I think. It's fame. God's desire is to make his name famous, to give his name fame. That's why we're on earth. You realize, here I'm slipping into that just talking mode, but, but you realize that we're not here for ourselves, right? We are here for him, to give him fame. We are not here for ourselves, for our own agendas, for our own reputations, pastor, brother and sister in the workforce, just to make a name for yourself or just to provide for your family. That's a noble cause and that's a scriptural thing. But it's not the ultimate end of man. The ultimate end of man is not to live for ourselves and use God as a means for our end. But for God to use us as a means for his end. That's worship. Worship is to give God fame. You know, we talk about commitment because, you know, we have diluted our involvement in the kingdom of God to being involved. And I was talking with a brother just the other day and he helped straighten out some vocabulary for me, and I'd like to share that with you a little bit. You know, it's one thing for us to be involved. For you to be involved in your church is a good thing, but that's not really what Jesus is looking for. To take it a step further, we need to be committed to the cause of Christ. But even that word slipped into Christian vocabulary a bit prematurely. Commitment still speaks of our being in some kind of control where we make a conscious commitment to the Lord. Well, I think it should be conscious, but I don't think it should merely be a commitment. I think the word that we should be looking for is surrender, where we are simply tools in the hands of God for him to accomplish his, his purposes on the earth, and that would be to give his name fame. To give God fame begins with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord means that we are living our lives with a basic conviction that we will be judged. Even if we're a believer and we're confident and we're washed with the blood of Jesus, we don't live in some human, soulish form of fear where we're living under condemnation and we never do enough. That's not from God. You don't need to fear that way. However, there is a fear for the believer that our works on the earth will be tested. And to live with that recognition, in fact, to delight in it, knowing that God is giving us opportunity after opportunity to serve him and to build up the wealth of our reward at that great judgment seat, whether it's delightful or it's just a, a, a deep conviction that might cause you to shake. I tell you either way, to live in recognition that we will be judged is the fear of the Lord. It is the foundation of the kingdom of God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When we live in the fear of the Lord, we have one of the roots to worship in our hearts. Friend, you will stand before God. I will stand before God. And I thank God for opportunities like this and anything else he calls me to do because I know this will be evaluated and I know that I shall be rewarded because my Father is gracious and he's looking to bless me. Nonetheless, it still keeps a check on my life. The fear of the Lord means that I submit every aspect of my life, no matter what. I submit every aspect to reverence Him. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you're seeking wisdom on how to raise your kids, if you're seeking God's wisdom on how to relate to your spouse or to your parents, on how to answer back that person you work with that's so nasty and is always getting on your case, if in all these different areas of life, in your family, how you serve the Lord at church, the way you relate to a stranger on the street, the way you relate to someone of the opposite sex, if you are concerned about what God thinks about that, that is seeking for wisdom, and that is showing that you have the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord recognizes that we will be judged. The fear of the Lord seeks God's wisdom in every aspect of life, and the fear of the Lord realizes that everything we have comes from Him. We don't own our bodies. We don't own our time. We don't own our schedule. We don't own our houses, our, our cars, the things that we have or that we thank God for here in America. None of these things belong to us. When I stay in someone else's house, if I'm traveling on the road or we're just visiting somewhere, when I get up in the morning, even though I have to, um, Gina, you might want to shut your ears for this, but I make my bed when I'm on the road. <laughs> um, 
I'm, I'm under conviction right now, in fact. <laughs> and they'll tell me, you know, you don't have to do that. Now, the hotel is different because I'm paying money to have someone else do it. That's different. I want to show respect. To... Anyway, the reason why I make my bed when I'm on the road, if you can handle such a deep analogy, is because this house and this room doesn't belong to me. It belongs to somebody else. Therefore, I'm a bit more conscious and sensitive to the way I go about things. Okay, you can unplug your ears, actually. Our lives don't belong to us. Our schedules don't belong to us. The way we spend our time doesn't belong to us. Our bodies don't belong to us. And when we recognize these things and live our lives, not with some soulish fear, but with a reverent fear for God, who is Lord of all these things and has lent us all these things for His use, that is living in the fear of the Lord. And when you have that kind of fear in your heart, that kind of intimacy, with God on every aspect of life. Friend, when you come into a worship service, there's, there's a certain continuity from what's going on outside to what's about to transpire on the inside. Let me encourage you that to worship is to fear the Lord. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the one who destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. The root of worship, friend, is the fear of the Lord. But worship is also to adore Him. It's not just fear. It's not just repentance and getting right and keeping all of life in line. That's a part of it, but that's not all of it. Worship is simply the sheer delight of knowing God. I don't know about you, but when God began to revive my soul and I began to seek revival many years, bef many years ago, before, if I remember right, uh, God was stirring people years ago, even before these things began to pop up. I know there were things going on, but it wasn't time yet for Toronto. It wasn't time yet for Brownsville. But when my soul began to get stirred, it's when I just, I just seemed to rediscover just how utterly delightful Jesus is. Man, I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. <laughs> And intimacy with Jesus, and to adore Jesus for all of his goodness, for all of his greatness, that's, that's the spring of life. I mean, even in revival, we can get so caught up in the routine, we get into the Martha syndrome, and we forget the Mary syndrome that just sits at the feet of Jesus and listens to his word. And Jesus said, that's the good part. So when I'm talking about getting all, all of life under the jurisdiction of God, I'm not talking about getting mechanical. I'm talking about finding just how wonderful Jesus is. The scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When scripture uses the senses of our body to illustrate for us the goodness of God and how good an experience with God is, it's trying to get our attention. God did not give us the ability to taste food to smell flowers, to see some really cool landscape or the awesome majesty of his creation just so that we can enjoy things for ourselves. But to show us that in the same way, only even more shall we enjoy God. The psalmist said, my soul thirsts for God. How can you thirst for a person? The Lord says, how can you not thirst for I'm the spring of living waters. I'm the fountain. Don't hew out for yourselves stones and cisterns that will be broken. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. I want to show you this in the New Testament. Revelation all the way to the end of your Bible. Chapter 3. I love the presence of God. I love it when I hit that sweet spot in prayer. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You just begin to fly. Whew. Feel like you could do anything. You just seem that you, it's like you could feel God just pulsating through your, through your gut. There's that settled peace. There's that knowledge that you can't work up. My Father is kind. He's gracious. He gives peace. He gives joy. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody you really love to be with? 
I said, man, I love to hear him speak, or I just like to hang out with him. Just got a way about him. It makes me feel good about myself. Just sets me at ease. He's disarming. I don't feel all tense. That's the way God is. He just loved to be in his presence. He loved to taste and to see that the Lord is good. When Jesus addresses the church in Laodicea in verse 14 of chapter 3, he says in verse 15, listen, listen to the words he uses to illustrate a relationship with him. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Do you realize your life tastes like something to God? If I could take a little detour here. Do you realize the way you live your life and your worship and your prayers taste like something to God? You might say, well, it doesn't really taste like something to God. Well, it's the language he used. And if it's not a literal taste, which I think it is, then it's something far greater than just literally tasting something on the tongue. But when he talks about our lives being offered to him, he's talking about tasting something and enjoying something in his mouth. So that if something's hot, well, then that, that tastes like something. Or cold, at least I know where you stand. But lukewarm, that's particularly disdainful. So I'll spit that out of my mouth. In other words, I'll taste what you have to offer. I won't like it, so I'll spit it out before I consume it. When the sacrifices were offered in the Old Testament, they would offer up the sacrifices and they would, they would burn them and the smoke would go up and it said that it would be a soothing aroma in the nostrils of the Lord. He enjoyed the smell if it came from a broken heart and out of obedience. It was pleasing to the Lord. It wasn't just their duty. It was a fellowship to give him joy. And when we surround him in worship and we offer the fruit of our lips, the scripture says, that tastes like something to God. He is sitting at the table and we are serving him. And when you are right with him and you offer your praise and your worship, it says the prayer of the upright is his delight. He enjoys that. You are nourishing the Lord when you offer up sincere worship. You have to know that based on this text. When Jesus tasted that sour wine on the cross, it says he tasted it, but he was unwilling to drink it. To taste something is one thing, and to swallow it is something different. When we are hot in our relationship with God, our worship soothes his sense of smell, it soothes his taste, and he enjoys to consume us, to consume our praise. Let's read on. Verse 17, because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. It's interesting that the church that's lukewarm is also the church that can't really see reality. They're tricked by outward appearances because their inward senses are dull. Listen, the church that is lukewarm, it means that its inward senses are dull and they're, they're not in touch with reality. They're not in touch with God. Well, so how do you strengthen your senses to know the Lord? You partake of the things of heaven. You adore the Lord the way you would adore a good meal. You enjoy it and you consume it. Jesus said, you must eat my flesh, drink my blood, you'll have eternal life. Friends, it's, to adore God is more than just appreciating who he is. It's, it's experiencing him so that he alone is the delight of your soul. Where do you find satisfaction? What are you eating? To adore the Lord is to be satisfied with him the way the body is satisfied with good food, enjoyable food. Look here. In verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, see, perception in the ears, and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him 
and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When we delight in the Lord the way our bodies delight in food, our spiritual senses get sharp, friends. Worship is to adore God. Worship means we are genuinely delighted in the things of God. Worship means we are genuinely delighted in the things of God. His presence is delightful. His word is delightful. In the Old Testament, they had some stipulations on certain foods you can eat and certain foods you can't eat. It's called a kosher diet. Certain things you can't eat. But then Jesus came and it said he declared all foods clean. He said it doesn't matter what you put in your body. It doesn't matter, but it does matter what you put in your heart. Because the kosher diet of the Old Testament was symbolic of what we eat with our minds and our hearts in the new. So let me ask you something. What are you dining on, friend? Have you been eating pork with your heart? Unclean food? You know, there are some things that are unclean, some things that are clean. Is your diet the holy things of the Lord? I tell you the truth. If they are not, then your spiritual senses are dull and you may not even realize that you're falling away. But Jesus said if you're eating the right kind of diet, your senses will be sharp. You'll be able to see with the inner eye and hear with the inner ear. So that when I knock, what does it say? You'll hear the knock? It says you hear my voice. Lots of people hear the knock. But all they hear is like the peanuts, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can't get what God's trying to say. Lord, what are you trying to say? Well, I can't seem to hear your voice. Well, what have you been eating? You see, John heard the voice of the Lord here in Revelation. Jesus said, if you hear my voice because you've been dining on the right things, I'll come in. You open the door to me, I'll come in and we'll have that communion. You go to the next level. So look here, the next verse here, chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. See, that's just what Jesus said would happen. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and dine with you. If you're delighting in the things of heaven, I'll open the door and you will be able to perceive the things of God. Worship is to delight in the things of the Lord. And when you do, your spiritual senses perk up, they get sharp, and you get revelation. Some people say to me, why doesn't my Bible read the way your Bible does? Where do you get perception? Friend, it's no big deal. It's not being smart. I love Jesus. And I delight in his presence, in seeking his face, and listening to his word. And I find I hear from God because my senses are getting sharper and sharper and sharper. I'm not just a baby who can only digest milk. I'm getting where I'm getting things I can taste it. I got to chew it before I swallow it. Then it, I consume it. It becomes a part of me, and I get, I get bigger, and I get stronger in spirit. To worship God is to adore God. To adore God is to delight in God with the spirit the way the body delights in food. To worship God is to magnify the Lord. We are put on this earth to give Him glory. We are made in the image of God, which means when people see us, when they hear us, their attention must be turned to the Lord. The word in Hebrew, hallelujah, have you ever heard it? You know it's a command, right? Hallelujah. It means praise Yah, praise the Lord. You probably know that. And you've probably heard that, therefore, we're called by command to worship God. And it is commanded. That's absolutely true. But did you know that that's not the only purpose of the word hallelujah, but it's also a command in our own mouths that we are put on the earth to call the rest of creation to worship our God. One of the reasons why it says in Scripture that God complains of His people, it says that 
because of you, my name is blasphemed all day long? Did you know that God depends on you and me to live our lives in such a way, to be a witness in such a way, to enjoy the Lord genuinely and deeply in such a way that our lives demand that the people around us recognize our God? The word hallelujah is just not a command to me, it's a command through me. When I say hallelujah, I'm commanding the rest of lower creation to recognize the God I serve. That's my job as somebody being in the image of God, to say hallelujah. My life should say hallelujah. You praise the Lord. When someone who's truly broken before God and really following him, who knows what goes on around him in the spirit realm when he says hallelujah. Who knows how many demons stop everything and go, Phew, choo, Yah's God, Yah's God. Ah. You don't know. I had some friends who, uh, they, have a, they had an uncle that they went to visit. He's unsaved and he had a, a breakdown and he became uh, very emotionally and mentally unhealthy. He couldn't focus. He didn't talk right. And they went to the psychiatric part of the hospital to visit him. And uh, he, he wasn't making any sense. He couldn't carry on a normal conversation. But they convinced him, you know, let us pray for you. So they prayed for him. And uh, they, just, they just prayed the best way they knew how. And they left. And lo and behold, the next day, he was suddenly and totally healed. And after that, what, you know, what was the result of the natural course of events from this couple that went to pray for this man? What what is this about your God that, that did that? I, I believe that it was the God you prayed to that brought me to health. Their life naturally lived, demanded that the person around them worship their God. God wants the nations to know his name. Worship is to magnify him and make him famous. It is our agenda as worshipers. Let me give you one verse that illustrates this. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 2. It's really all over the Old and New Testaments, but I'm just going to give you one example. Joshua 2, we'll start with verse 8. This is the story when the harlot Rahab of the city of Jericho hid some of the spies of the Hebrews. Why was she willing to hide these Hebrews? I'll tell you why. It says it right here in the text. She says it herself. Verse 8, before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, in verse 9 now, Joshua 2.9, I know that Yahweh has given you the land. <laughs> How did she know that? And that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For Yahweh, your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. These events occurred 40 years ago, man. Forty years before, a whole generation. And so pointed were these stories that when these Hebrews finally came, this woman said, we heard about you. We heard those stories. Your God is the true God. That confession by itself, that is the agenda of God. To so express himself through his people's worship that the heathen around us are forced to say, your God, he is God. Your God, he is God. What of it, of the tired church of Jesus Christ in America? What do they say about your God? Not much. Where are the true worshipers who will worship God in spirit and in truth? 
whose life and ministry demands the people around them make a choice and worship. This is exactly what Jesus taught about when he said, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. It is a life of worship that demands the confession of the heathen. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is trying to straighten this church out that was getting all fleshly in its application of the spiritual gifts. And they were just exercising those gifts that they thought were more prominent. They were actually trying to communicate to one another in tongues. And Paul comes and says, that's not making any sense to people. Tongues is great. Not the way you're using it. Paul says, prophesy. If your worship service is characterized by prophecy, then those who are visiting or who are unbelievers, they will fall on their faces because you've exposed their hearts. And they will say that God is truly among you. That's a church at worship. They see into the spirit realm and they hook into it and express it on the earth. So that our lives and our ministry, our worship demands because of the supernatural power that our God is the only God. Isn't this what happened with the Samaritan woman? As soon as Jesus gave her one insight into her life, she said, oh, you're a prophet. You know, our fathers used to worship. It's, it's, immediately she becomes religious and a worshiper. Because Jesus was a worshiper of God, and worshipers know their God, and they do exploits, and demand of people around them the worship of their God. To worship God is to magnify his name. Amen? Good, I'm glad you agree. Go for it. Finally, to worship God is to engage His presence. That is to seek personal intimacy and communion. Just before I came up here, I was thinking of that story in Exodus chapter 19 and beyond that. When God was about to descend on the top of the mountain, you remember the story? He was going to descend from heaven on the top of the mountain and all the people were gathered before him. And uh, they had to put a border around the mountain so that no people would cross the border and no animals would cross the border, not even animals, because they couldn't come near the mountain. Now God was going to come down, right? And he was going to reveal himself in a certain measure. But even then, there still had to be a certain distance, not just between God and the people, but between the thing God was touching and the people. And another thing he said was this, besides the border, he said, don't go near a woman for three days. Now, why do you think God would say, don't go near a woman for three days? Well, because fornication is a sin and God won't dwell with sin. Well, surely... God did not want them to commit fornication and, and uh, make the, the camp unclean. But why would God say only do that for three days? Then you can go back to your sin? No, God was not telling them not to fornicate. God was telling them not to have any intimate relationship for three days. Because something more intimate was about to occur. God was going to come down and enter into a covenant with his people. When we think about revival, when we think about worship, when we think about prayer, we usually only think about ourselves. What do you think God thinks when he visits his people? How do you think God feels when he reveals something about himself? The reason why God would not have these people enter into an intimate relationship for three days is because he was about to come down and enter into an intimate fellowship with his people. And even good and legitimate relationships were not appropriate in the vicinity of what God was about to do. God was about to expose himself. He was about to engage his people on an intimate level. And he said, look, since that's the case, don't just go enter into another relationship right now. Don't even have normal and good relationships with your wives, with your husbands, with your spouses for three days. Just hold off. Something far more intimate is about to occur. 
When we pray, Lord, show us your glory, do you realize what you're asking? You're asking for a person to expose his deepest feeling and substance to you. You think he just wants to prostitute that to any passerby? Oh, come on, show us your glory. Yeah, show us your glory. Do you have the kind of background in reckoning and relating with God the way Moses did when he said that? That was a man who meant it. Do you discuss your inmost secrets with any stranger that walked by and asked you? No, you want to know that person will engage you personally, and you can trust that person. It's the same thing with God. That's why he's seeking a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth, because they're the ones he shares his secrets with. What do you think about that? You should like that. God's a person. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Sure, list whatever you want. We act like he's a machine or a prostitute, not a person who desires intimacy. And worship is intimacy. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. God's the same way as us in our feelings. He will talk to the one he trusts. And the one that he trusts is the one who engages his presence. That's the one who'll start hearing from God. Because that's the one who's worshiping him. That's good. You know, when I talk with my wife or I talk with anybody, oh, let's say it like this. Have you ever... Man, this is a miracle, Pastor. This is great. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they're not listening and you know they're not listening? That better not be you. Now I'm coming out. See if you just make this personal. And then when you're done talking, you say, you weren't listening to me. And they say, I heard everything you said. And they did. And they'll reiterate everything you said. That's still not the point. They may have heard, but they weren't listening. See, if you are going to have a good relationship with somebody, you and the other person, you are going to have to engage one another. Eye contact, facial expression, that you're not faking it. You are showing, I am listening, and what you're saying is important. I'm stopping my life for the moment for you. Now, we won't do that for God, but then ask him to do it for us. But God's not looking for people who won't stop their lives for him to engage him. God is looking for people who will engage him the same way we ask him to engage us. You're listening, aren't you? That's what God is calling for when he calls for worship in spirit and in truth. And the beauty of it is every single person here, just by being yourself in spirit and truth, has the ability to engage the Lord. You don't have to wait for an emotion. We shouldn't have to wind you up at the beginning of worship. A mature church is not a church that has to be manipulated into worship. If you're mature and you want to be identified by the people of God and you want a real relationship with God and you really want God telling you his secrets, then be trustworthy by being the kind of person that engages the Lord. Say, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do I mean? Whatever I mean is what I mean. Just do it. Engage is engage. It's personal. If it's time for you to turn to prayer, then just do it. Don't wait for this, that, and the other thing. God's a person. He's giving you his time. Give him yours. Did you get in there? Prayer time? Jesus, you are the Lord. Oh, but I got problems. Friend, we all got problems. Engage. That's what he's looking for. You can just engage. I remember one time I was going down the street here in Pensacola. I had to go preach one morning. Man, that night before and that morning was one of the worst nights before and mornings of my life. Everybody was sick. Everything was happening wrong. And I had to go preach, and I was thinking of anything but spiritual thing. Man, I didn't even feel saved. And I didn't even sin. I didn't even feel saved. I remembered this very truth. I said, look, if I'm going to go preach it, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. So I went to my inner room where I go, my tent. I just started whirling before the Lord. And so I'm just getting a hold of God. That's it. 
It's that simple. That's all you got to do is engage. When I teach this to my students, they tell me, engage, Brother Gladstone, engage, engage. Yeah, that's all you got to do. You don't have to wait for a feeling. If you got to wait for a feeling, and I don't know if God's going to be the kind of person, you know, you're going to be the kind of person God shares with. You just got to get in there. So this is worship. Engage. Just get in. Grab a hold of God. In Isaiah, it says, no one rouses himself anymore to lay hold of God. Friend, there's nothing stopping you except for sin. You get that right, and all you have to do, no matter how you feel, no matter what the circumstances, is engage. And the church or the person that engages God, that is the mature worshiper in spirit and in truth. And when you engage God on a personal level, the two of you become the same way you become with any other person that you engage. You start to share with one another what's important. Some of us have no clue what God's real agenda is because we won't engage his presence. All you got to do is get in the habit of engaging God. Say, Lord, it's you. It's not what I need to hear from you. It's not just preparing myself for what I have to do, although all those things count. It's just you. I just engage. You engage enough, you become a friend of God. God begins to talk to you and tell you the things on his heart because he trusts you. Now, when you have things on your heart that have come from God's heart because you've engaged, you now have a really decent prayer list. Now, what do you think the chances are that if you ask for something that God put on your heart, what are the chances you're going to get those prayers answered? Pretty good. And I'll refer to this text. I think I have it right. You don't have to turn there. John 15, verse 7, I think. Jesus is talking about abiding in the vine. Abiding, engaging, intimate, union. If you abide in me, engage, intimate, that's, just, that's, that's the foundation of my life. Now, all this complicated thinking, what i got to do, I'll leave that to the Spirit. I just engage. I just get in. So Jesus said, you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? It all starts with worship on the level of engage. The one who joins himself to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. That is worship. And the person of the church that can worship God like that in spirit and in truth, that's the church who will know his secrets and who will effectively magnify his name among the nations. I would like for you all to stand right now and engage the Lord. Now you're ruined. You don't have to wait for nothing anymore. So you got no excuse. Say, well, I feel carnal. I feel dry. I'm not so sure. That is not what we base our worship on. We just engage because of him. My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit does rejoice in God my Savior. This song? Come on, guys, spend a few moments. Say, well, I'm a little bit tired. That's the beauty of it. You don't have, you don't have to use the way your body feels as an authority for you to engage the Lord because you're more mature than that. You're stronger than that. You are God's friend. We just engage right here. Be strong in the Lord, people of God, and worship Him, not in feeling necessarily, but in spirit and in truth. Let the feelings get in line later, friend. Just continue to cry out. <clears throat> if you're standing here and you know that you know that you have sin in your heart and in your life that's keeping you from a real relationship of worship, then you put that under the blood right now by asking for forgiveness and turning away permanently. 
you make any adjustments or changes at home or in your life or your, in your relationships that you need to make and enter into worship right now in Jesus' name. People of God, worship the Lord. You remember this when, you're, when you are faced with trouble. You remember this when you're at home and you got nothing to do. You remember this when you come to church and the music starts. You remember this in every situation. You can do it anywhere, anytime. Engage the Lord and build a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. I love God the Father. I love the covenant of God. I love the blood. I love the kingdom. I love the people of God. I love the victory. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. She Hallelujah. Oh, I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I don't think any of us will, will ever misunderstand worship anymore. It's fame. <laughs> Praise God. It's fame. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Teach. It's good. Enjoyed that. Praise God. It's good for us. Amen. We'll go with God and God will go with you. Have a great week and we'll see you on Sunday. Or no, we'll see you tomorrow night in the uh, school service and then Friday night in revival and Saturday night in revival and then Sunday. God bless you.